Hey everybody, welcome back to our Friday. It's Friday here in the land of cannabis information. The center of the cannabis universe is actually here in Toronto, not in California. No, no, no. No. Nope. It's downtown Toronto on the 29th floor, 130 King Street West, where there also happens to be a stock exchange. We are in the exchange. We're in the exchange tower. This is the exchange tower of cannabis power, yo. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm picking up. You putting down, yo, yo. We should we should finish every sentence with yo. Yo, I think you're right. You want to talk about Chiron, yo? Yo. <laughs> yo. Yo. You know what yo is? Yeah, is it's, uh, it's, it's you and no. No, it's uh, Czechoslovakian for yes. You know how I know? Because all the gay porns I watch, the guys are in it going, yo, yo, yo. <laughs> Just kidding, Ed. Um, the <laughs> well, either that or it's, it's a contest for it's people using a yo-yo. <laughs> Actually, they use it to call their neighbors in Iceland. Yo! Yo! And in China. That's people that can't pronounce the J properly. As, as, as neighbors are called, their names are Joe, and they're saying yo. Right. Hey, yo. Okay, this is going. Okay. We're so, off to so a nice Friday. Go sideways. Let's take a look at my garden, Ed. Can we do that? Well, I, I want to just point out first something important. Okay. Chiron, we yeah. said yesterday, it was getting down to a level near support. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, today, 350 up about 20 odd cents. So you probably 20 trade, odd cents, not 20. 23, yeah, three is odd, 20 odd cents. Oh, okay. Yeah, so nice trade, nice trade. Not bad. Okay. Now let me tell you about something that I think is important. Okay, your plants. That's right. Here are they, they are. Blowing in the wind? There they are, blowing in the Wait wind. Wait a minute, I did, they look like they're moving. Actually, you know what? You know they what? They were moving, but it just froze because as soon as we went to the NDI. You know what? What? The fan shut off. No, it's not the fan shut off. The request timed out. I've got to go back in here, and we're going to hit it again because we had a malfunction in Sector 9, which in the technological environment we find ourselves no. immersed in is no big surprise. A malfunction request timed in Sector What the hell? A malfunction This, su this suggests that my nine. server went down at home. Uh-oh. Oh, no. The dogs got it. The dogs. Fucking up shit again. <sighs> that dogs are going to get beaten when I get home. Uh-oh. Unless they get that server back online. Uh, we have a really interesting show today. Um, the conversations uh, are going to be longer than normal. Why? Because I'm feeling a little bit windy. <laughs> windy? Should I clear the room? Well, not unless you want to freshen your Hold air. on. Hold on a second. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I've just... <laughs> The humor is going down into the toilet again. Let's take a look at what's coming up today, shall we? Let's try to get this back on track. Our spectacular, intrepid news nurse, Ricky Gerwitz, back in the pink, is here at 3.05 with, yes, you guessed right, the news. Uh, James Burns, the CEO of Alcana Inc., which is used to be called Liquor Stores, N.A., uh, he'll be here at 3.15 with some really insightful uh, and really interesting developments within the... Uh, Cannabis store. He's opened up a cannabis store down the street. DMT Zaitsev is here. Dimethyltryptamine Zaitsev is our uh, intrepid analyst on all things derivative. He's what here at 3.30. What did you call it? What? Dimeth Dimethyltryptamine. DMT. It's a hallucinogenic of very short oh. duration, but intense graphic light. And then at 3.30, we've got uh, charting man Dan McDermott will be here. And uh, 4.10... Actually, Dan will be here at 3.45. At 4.10, we'll be chatting with Alan Brockstein from 420 Investor. And uh, then at 4.26, it being Friday, we'll show you the outtakes that were not taken out this week. Loopers. Loopers, they're called. What do you think of that, Ed? You um, could call them loopers, boopers, or bloopers. So, Ed, let me tell you this. Let me ask you this, actually. Okay. You're the accountant in okay. the crowd. I am the accountant. Okay, if, it's, if the market closes at 4... Raise my it, chair. And it's three o'clock. What percentage of the trading day is over? Say it again. If the market closes at four p.m. Right. And it's three o'clock now. Right. What percentage of the trading day is over? Dun 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 dun. About eighty-five percent. No, that's not bad. That's very fast. 
Five and a half out of six and a half. There's six and a half trading hours. Mm -hmm. So five and a half's over. Mm -hmm. Five and a half, six and a half is 55 out of 65. It's about 85%. That's really that's now I'm now I'm just blown away. Well, that that you see you have a forte. Yes. We're not sure what that is yet. <laughs> but smart ass one liners. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's your forte, right? Yeah. No, 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 no. I, 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 I'm a percentage guy. Really? Yeah. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. You know, we should have been hanging out much longer than uh, we have been because I yeah. probably would have saved a little money. You, you probably would have. Yeah. You probably would. no, no. Yeah, I, I, everything, everything to me is percentages. Uh, there's Aurora going by at this uh, 85%, uh, 15% left of the trading day, at 12.28, up 33 cents on the day. Um, do you think that we can still attribute that $2.28 billion in uh, market cap to um, the, the Peltz effect, Norman Peltz? I don't know. I was, uh, I was you, told... You, you know what? Look, 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 they're working on some things, obviously. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, this oh, is not... This yeah. is not the, there's an initial pop, and we, you know, we've seen the, the Peltz effect immediately. But I'm sure they've got some bigger fish to fry. Bigger fish to fry, like tuna? Bigger? Tuna are big. Tuna are big. D they're actually very unique fish, you know. Tuna? Yeah. How so? Well, apparently they go they're, they're different. They're, they're, they're uh, you know how they talk about fish being warm-blooded and cold-blooded? Yes. And all this? They're unique. Apparently, there's a different system in a tuna than the rest of the fish. Really? Uh, apparently. And so are the tunas like the rulers of the sea? They're, they're remarkable, yeah, and they're very hard to find. So of all the animals in the sea, which one would you say is the boss? Uh, I'd say probably the one you don't want to be messing with is a uh, killer whale. Killer whale is the boss. Oh, I don't well, know. And you know what, what also is a very formidable creature is a, is a, is a giant, giant uh, octopus or a giant squid. Yeah, I could tear you limb from limb. Yeah. Literally, eight ways till eight. Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? Flaying, Hold I think on, they call baby. that. Yeah. No, Flaying. no, you know, you know what? There, there's, some there's obviously a lot of intelligence. Like, you talk about intelligence, but there's different... Just because they can't talk and, you know, do what we do, right. doesn't mean they're not intelligent. Well, this like, is the thing. I would consider the killer whales and the octopi rather employees of the boss because they're really just muscle. Okay. And, and so and the boss the, is going to be more like I bet you the dolphin or maybe the sponge or the the sponge fish or the squid. Bob Squarepants what's his name? <laughs> Bob, Bob Squarepants. <laughs> no, I think it's Nemo. Nemo, tiny fish, big brain for a fish. Anyways, we are getting off topic. I just wanted to point out my garden here. Okay, let's. I hear it blowing in the wind again. Look yeah, at, there look we at, go. There, now there, there's there. my garden. See, Wait. this is live from my house. I am growing four species of plant, uh, four species of cannabis. Uh, two are high CBD, and no, sorry. One is equal part CBD THC, one is high CBD, low THC, and the other two are high THC, low CBD. All uh, indica primaries, except the uh, except the uh, critical mass is uh, thirty percent sativa. So you you those plants have different chemical compositions when it comes to THC and CBD. Yeah. Uh, well, different seeds. They yeah, they're different seed. They I, came from I, different I, seeds. Is there a hot air balloon around here no, somewhere? No, that's the, that's actually the fan in the room that you, is out of sight oh. of the picture. It's up above. Uh, unfortunately, I can't manipulate this camera remotely, but I should get one that I can I get a PTZ head inside the tent so I can shoot it around. As you can see, the air is flowing very nicely up there. No, that would be crazy. But so these plants, you recall that I screwed them up because I mixed the soil wrong. Yeah. Uh, but now you can see that green and the lushness uh, of, the, of the leaves indicates that they are now extremely happy ladies. And they are going to be doing some serious putting out. And the fun here is going to be to watch these plants grow. We're gonna grow them, gonna veg them for four more weeks, get, that means 18 hours of light per day. Then I'm gonna throw them into bud mode, which means I reduce the light per day they get exposed to to 12 hours. And voila! In eight to 10 weeks, I will be harvesting my own homegrown bud and we will be smoking it. And you, you, you won't be uh, going to the uh, 
Cannabis just store? Cannabis store anymore. Well, we're still like... Uh, Maybe you'll have your own cannabis store. Or you, or you won't have a license. Well, I never needed a license in the past. What makes you think I need one now? Exactly. I've got cannabis. Maybe I'm just going to start. Maybe I'm going to start up the first publicly traded black market cannabis outlet. No, that would be cool. Wow. Yeah. The address. You know, you'd probably get away with it for a while before they figured out what was going well, on. Especially if on my cedar filings I put the wrong address. It's like, huh, that's not where he's growing this marijuana. And then yeah. they'd be looking for me, and it'd be like grow tents like this, all clandestine and shit. And it'd be like, boom, I'm back to teenage high school years, selling, slinging dope out the back door. While we're talking here, I just noticed something cross the screen. What's that? I saw Tilray go by at 59.50. Tilray is bleeding. Ble slowly. No, well, not so slowly. Not slow, slowly. Like, it wasn't long ago that somebody down, Jeffrey's downgraded, remember? And then it dropped and I said, what did they know? What do they see? And all of a sudden now we're starting to see what they see. Yeah. This thing's under 60 bucks. Well, I know. What's 60 times? Uh, and forget that, that, that crazy move we saw at the top, which could have been black boxes and all that mysterious, you know, Merlin shit. I say to you, this stock looks slower. You think it's going down even lower? Well, I don't... Pull up I, a chart, Ed. Let's not speculate. Okay. Let's show me some technical evidence that your theory might actually be well, correct. Let's... I, I'm, I, you know what? It, <laughs> I, I say, say to you... What? Come on here. Okay, here we go. What? Yeah, okay. How, how about we listen to Ricky Gerwitz in the news while you're muckatucking around there? Here are the headlines, moving markets today. Aurora Cannabis Inc. has been selected by the German Federal Institute for Drugs and Medical Devices as one of the three winners in the public tender to cultivate and distribute medical cannabis in Germany. The tender saw 79 companies participating and the selection process was based on the submission of a concept for domestic cannabis production, delivery and pricing. Aurora was awarded the maximum number of five of the 13 lots in the tender over a period of four years with a minimum supply of 4,000 kilograms total. The cannabis produced will be sold to the German government and supplied to wholesalers for distribution to pharmacies. A free Inc. was also granted a license in Germany, giving the company five of the 13 available lots, each with a minimum annual capacity of 200 kilograms. The third licensed producer to be granted the German license was Wayland Group through its German joint venture Demikin GmbH. The three companies that have been selected are subject to a review period, after which a final decision will be made no earlier than April 17, 2019. Feneva Inc. announced preliminary revenue of $14 million for the three-month period ending on March 31, 2019. This represents a 169% increase over the $5.2 million in revenue generated in the same three-month period from 2018. Blisco Cannabis Corp. announced that their premium cannabis products are now available to be purchased in British Columbia online via BC cannabis stores and available for wholesale purchase by provincially licensed private retailers. Grown Rogue International Inc. announced today that stock options have been granted to two consultants of the company to purchase up to an aggregate of 650,000 common shares of the company. The stock options are exercisable at a price of 44 cents per share with 150,000 of the options expiring on November 30th, 2021 and 500,000 of the options expiring on January 1st, 2022. The company also issued a total of 570,500 common shares to certain directors and officers. Fire & Flower Holdings Corp. announced the opening of Brock Street Cannabis Company, the second Fire & Flower branded store in Ontario. Believe Inc. announced that it has received a building permit and has moved forward in the Health Canada licensing process for its facility in London, Ontario. In September 2018, Believe purchased the existing 250,000 square foot greenhouse facility and has since been developing the property. Believe has invested roughly $8 million in the property to date and once completed as expected later this year, will provide an additional 115,000 square foot of greenhouse grow space and over 11,000 square feet of indoor grow space. Dixie Brands Inc. has announced plans to introduce a new confectionery product called Dixie Bursts. The pulled taffy chews will be sold in assorted packages containing blue raspberry, mango, and strawberry flavors. Each individually wrapped burst will contain 10 milligrams of THC. And that's your news for today. Uh, yeah, dig it, Ricky. 
Way to knock it out of the park there. Uh, I wanted to uh, let you know, people. Yo, people! Actually, first things first, let's take a look at who's here in the audience. Um, and let's look at the Tilray chart because that's what we were going to do and we never did. So let's okay. let's do that because I'm okay. sure. You want to look at the Tilray chart? Quick, we'll yeah. look at okay, the Tilray so just, chart. Look at, look at this. Tilray, this, is, this is when Tilray the downgrade chart. came from, uh, from, uh, from Jeffries, right in here somewhere. And then it, it rallied back, you know, just a three or four loop. And look at this thing now, under 60 bucks. And, and uh, that's, that's clearly pointing south. I think everyone would agree. And let's put up the one year chart and look. We are now, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what do you got, one. Ed? Spit it out. Well, it just looks like, look, we had this all this action, blah, blah, blah. And there's a lot of other smaller companies doing well. Yeah. And some of the bigger ones really can't catch a bid right now. Yeah. Like, and Tilray is one of the biggest ones, right? Yeah, well, Tilray's, uh, Tilray's certainly, um, you know, it does, doesn't help that Jefferies comes out all bullish on the cannabis sector and then singles out Tilray for a downgrade. So, I mean, it's funny how a company's perceived value can be so decimated by one influencer like that. And the thing is that Owen, uh, oh, what the hell is his last name? The, the analyst at, uh, at uh, Jefferies, uh, he's got a big following because he's, uh, you know, been at it for a while. Um, on our audience today, I want to say hello to Scott Campbell, Travis R., uh, James Watson, uh, Nika Domi, Maddie T65, Carl Bowden, Robin Bottieri says, nice plants. Thanks, Robin. Your pants are pretty nice, too. Scott Campbell, hope Chartman Dan is actually confirmed for today. Charting Man Dan is going to be here, I guarantee it. Barring, barring a technical unforeseen catastrophe yeah. like uh, the internet goes down or Skype crashes. Those are possibilities. We've been having a lot of problems with Skype lately. Uh, let's see, Mr. Green Thumbs 420, how are you doing here today? William Lay, Ivan Black, John Murphy, James Watson, Toro Loco, crazy bull that means, I like that. Uh, yeah, Donnie Greco, Great White Shark. Okay, um, William Lay. How are you doing, everybody? Good to see you here on this Friday. Uh, wanted to, uh, yeah, okay. Throw. You want me to throw Ed? Throw. Yeah, let's. <laughs> What, should, what do they call that? There's, isn't there that thing where they throw these big logs and Ed, can you read the teleprompter screen? for me, please? Uh, no, thanks. <laughs> I know what it's meant to say. Okay, enough of this tomfoolery. James Burns is going to be here in just a minute, but first let's take a look at this little snippet, tidbit, smidgen segment. Oh. Inc. is one of the largest private sector retailers of alcohol in North America, operating 236 locations in Alberta, British Columbia, and Alaska. The company also operates five cannabis retail stores under the Nova Cannabis brand in the province of Alberta. With revenues in excess of $600 million per year, Alcana processes over 18 million individual retail transactions of beverage, alcohol, and cannabis. In August 2018, the company signed a license agreement with Aurora, giving Alcana exclusive rights to open retail cannabis stores under the Aurora brand name across Canada. Alcana Inc. is listed on the TSX under the symbol CLIQ. James Burns joins me now via Skype. He's the CEO of Alcana. James, welcome back. Hey James, good to see you. Yes, you too. Uh, James, let's go straight to the 800-pound uh, the gorilla in the room. Uh, your share price has basically been cut in half since the last time I talked to you. Why is that, and how is it going to go in the other direction? Well, if I knew why the stock market did things, James, I'd be a multi-billionaire. So <laughs> things, the things are what they are. Right. Uh, we, um, our company is uh, transforming itself from a dividend paying uh, income stream um, to into a growth company uh, with uh, several lines of business uh, where we intend to grow aggressively in the liquor and cannabis fields and uh, to do that we eliminated our dividend um, 
because we have much better use for our capital in, inside our business with our investments and obviously people who own this on whom the stock has a dividend play um, a lot of them sold and uh, went to other yield yield investments so that was probably a, a major reason uh, the other reason I think is again as we transform and uh, become very competitive in our market to uh, uh, the liquor business in particular to um, get back the market share that had been lost over several years uh, our uh, short-term cash flow uh, we are reinvesting that in margin and in price in the marketplace and that reflects in quarterly cash flow results and uh, people who trade based on multiples of cash flow uh, would see that uh, the same metrics they were seeing in our company in previous years weren't there anymore. So those are possibly some of the reasons, James. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's 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 an excellent explanation, and uh, and I I was unaware that your uh, plan had been to become more of a uh, growth through organic story rather than a dividend play. That's what would excited me. So I understand, of course, when you announce that you're going to terminate the dividend in, in pursuit of a growth strategy, that makes perfect sense. And it looks like since you have undertaken that path, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing looking at the chart here that that was an out sometime uh, towards the end of last year but since the beginning of this year you've actually uh, you know you've added uh, 50 60 percent in value yeah that's right that's right James we uh, announced uh, in uh, later in December which was the time we would have paid the dividend for the fourth quarter that we uh, were not doing so and uh, would not be doing so going forward so um, precipitated the sell-off as we just discussed uh, on, on certainly some investors who were interested in a dividend stock and uh, once that happened uh, the market seems to have uh, have responded favorably since then. You know, we put out some very impressive results since then. We announced our, uh, our, our Q4 results, uh, which were which were excellent uh, in terms of, uh, and as well as all of 018 in terms of same store sales. Uh, we had same store sales growth at uh, seven percent, which we haven't seen for six years, and that was in the face of a declining overall alcohol business in in Alberta. So. Um, as I said in our analyst call uh, in, in March, you know, we did exactly what we said we were going to do. We've taken on the competition. We're gaining extremely large market share back to our company, and uh, and that's only coming. That's not coming from new customers. Now, calls a very stable, very mature business. That's coming from existing customers. Sure. Uh, of our competition. So 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 we're so we're we're very pleased. We're on track. Everything that we have planned in our strategy, we're executing, and it's all coming to pass as we predicted, and we're going to stay the course, and uh, we are very confident we'll be successful. Sure. What percentage of your revenue comes from cannabis? Oh, it's minuscule now, James. The cannabis is... Uh, we had five stores open on October 17th, and many more under construction, and within three weeks, the licenses in here in Alberta were frozen by the regulator uh, due to lack of supply. Uh, here, and your viewers all know what happened in Ontario. Similarly, they went from a wide open market, uh, which will still be there in time, but for the time being, the lottery, the 25 winners, everybody knows the story. So uh, we are working with one of the lottery winners in Toronto, and we have a location at 499, 499 Queen Street West just a little west of Spadina, which uh, is going to wow. be a spectacular store. That's a great uh, location. As soon as we get it, uh, it's a great location. You know, great. It used to be in American Apparel. Um, it's a great location. Uh, a large store, 3,000 square feet, uh, and we'll be able to handle the volumes. We've designed it to be very, very transactional uh, in terms of processing the, the, the numbers, which we know will be there. Given that there's going to be so few stores, at least till December 13th, uh, as per the government's announcement, and they have the option, of course, to open it up earlier if supply comes earlier. But what we see here in Alberta, supply is getting worse, not better, at the moment uh, of the products that people want to buy. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's that's amazing. I mean, uh, when do, so when do you anticipate the Queen Street store opening? Oh, we, we were, we've been ready to open since uh, the last week of March. We were ready for April the 1st, but we're still uh, 
the AGCO, the regulator in Ontario, was going through its uh, due diligence process, checking people out and so on. And because um, uh, the lottery winner, uh, Heather Conlon, uh, it's, it's, she's the owner of the store, but because Alcana has uh, a services agreement with them and um, to help to help her, uh, as well as she's licensing our Nova Cannabis name, uh, the AGCO needs to check us out too. And so we're a bigger company, we've got a lot of directors, officers, and they need to check out every single individual. So that, that's just taking a little uh, a little time and uh, we anticipate it will be within the next couple of weeks, but it's out of our control. Sure. Well, that's uh, that's great for the lottery winner uh, to have somebody who's got, you know, an operating business supplying through a distribution channel all kinds of uh, recreational products. Let's say so. So that's yeah. that's great news. I'm very I'm very glad to hear that. That makes me think that at this price, the stock is probably a, a, a speculative buy. I mean. 33,000 square feet. I was just at a store in uh, 3, San Diego, which was doing $43 million, uh, did $43 million in 2018 from that single location. And it was certainly no bigger than 3,000 square feet. Uh, yeah, yeah, so. 3,000 is great. And we, we have, we're, you know, we've learned from here. We, we had the first couple of weeks in October when it was, it was crazy. Lineups from 10 to 10. Uh, basically, we, as fast as the tills could process, we sold product until it ran up. Uh, we learned from that and we've designed this store specifically around, I mean, we, we retailers, you know, we have 240 stores, we know how to retail. And we've designed this store specially to handle transactions, high transactions. It's uh, very cool. We had, uh, we uh, contracted a local, it's, it backs on uh, Graffiti Alley behind Queen Street there. And so we contracted a local graffiti artist who's uh, has a, an installation of six of his works inside. It's going to be a really, really great store. Well, uh, I'll have to go but, buy but it. You know, you, you, you only learn by doing things. And we've been doing this now for cannabis for, well, retail for 25 years, but cannabis retail since October 17th. And we know our stores, our five stores, just by what we read of uh, some of the other people in the cannabis retail business publish and, and disclose that on a per store basis, our stores, our five are significantly higher in volume than, than than the other retailers and that's in the face of extremely limited supply out here in Alberta right now right extremely limited okay how much uh, I, I mean when did you when did let me ask you this first James when did you start paying a dividend in Elkana oh the Elkana uh, which used to be called liquor stores in a went public Oh gosh, 2010, I believe, and it was, but it was an income trust, uh, and uh, maybe even a little earlier than that. But it was an income trust uh, at the time. I wasn't here then, so uh, and uh, it was designed strictly to pay out most of its cash flow. Switched to a corporation when income trusts uh, were no longer permitted by the government as a as a tax vehicle. So and has been paying the dividend uh, ever since. So it was a very different company than the company is today. One of the reasons we changed the name, other than the fact that liquor stores was not a particularly interesting name for a company and because we were getting into the cannabis business, but we also wanted to signal to investors that it's a very different company than, uh, you know, this, this ain't your father's liquor stores. So this is a different vehicle. We're gonna be very aggressive in the marketplace and grow um, uh, the cannabis business, uh, as soon as supply and regulations allow us, we're big. We're very, very big. We we can handle the leases uh, and pay leases while we wait for the supply and regulations to catch up. And we have excellent teams of retailers at all levels of the business, marketing, um, IT, finance, uh, all in place doing our 240 stores we already have, a few more, another 50, 100, it's easy for us, it's incremental. We can do it at very low ex additional cost. Wow, fantastic. Um, so James, is it conceivable that uh, upon attainment of a certain equilibrium or uh, you know continuity in, in cash flow, um, and would you return to paying out a dividend? Oh, you never know, James, you never know. Uh, certainly not for the foreseeable future. You know, you tend to pay dividends as corporations in theory when uh, you don't have investment opportunities inside your business or M&A or, or whatever 
which um, uh, have a, an appropriate return on capital, so you, you, you return the capital to the shareholders. Right. Um, we see with the, the, the cannabis business is going to be a tremendous growth vehicle for many, many, many years. So the chances of that business, liquor business is mature right now. We will have it uh, where we want it to be in Alberta within a year uh, easily. Um, the province of Ontario has already announced several times, including just last week, again, very strongly that uh, it is going to go to some kind of private sector uh, retail model for liquor. So that's a tremendous growth opportunity for us, uh, depending on how those rules are finally decided upon and announced. Uh, that with cannabis, um, we, we, we have some great, great investment opportunities with our cash for quite a long time to come, James. So I don't see paying a dividend anytime soon when we have that kind of ability to put capital to work really, really effectively. You bet. All right, James. Well, that's a fantastic update. I am looking forward to visiting your store. Please shoot me an email as soon as it's open because uh, we'd we love to sure. be there on opening day. Sure, we will for sure. We'll get about a week's notice, we're told, so we'll have lots of time to, uh, uh, to let you know, and uh, we, we welcome you down there. Great. Thanks, James. Well, we'll look forward to speaking to you then. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, James. Nice to talk to you again. Here's a uh, here's a skill testing question uh -oh. for you that uh, the winner will get uh, 500 million pounds of uh, my finest Manure. marijuana. Manure. No, good weed. Okay, 500 um, million pounds. Yeah, name all the people who were in that commercial that we just watched on the on the air there. If you can name all the people in that commercial, you will win 500 million pounds of uh, the best weed in the world. And you got to do it in one second. No, you don't have to do it in one second. You can, uh, you Two can take all day. See, the great thing about that whole segment there is to find out who they are. If you don't didn't actually catch the segment that they were in where their lower third says their name, uh, you can go back and find it. We should actually give away a real prize instead of like some bullshit 500 million. I'm going to give you away. How about that? Hey, can you, <laughs> you hey. get this right? You get a date with Ed. Well, and huh? listen, okay. Okay, huh? that's fair. Take a that's stab. Fair. Take a while. Guess. You know what? He's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm experienced. He's a good on a date. Let me tell uh, you. I tell you. And Even I'll, if you're a guy, he's an excellent wingman. I can tell you this. Yeah, wingman. Wingman. One-liners like you wouldn't believe. One-liners. Very subtle comments that flatter women without coming on to them. If you've already, if you're on a other date, you could take Ed on a date. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. Uh, I don't want to be considered to be dated, though. Dated. Dated. Well, once date I've, head. Once somebody's had a date with you, they dated you, and you have then been I'm dated. dated. But you're out of style. Date I'm out of style. Ed. I'm dating. your date Ed. Date Ed. Date. Ed. Boy, that yeah, meme I, is really I, useful. I know. It is. It is. A, it is a good moniker to have. That's not bad because it, you can. There's a lot of good. You know, it's easy Ed, steady Eddie. Remember Fast we were talking Eddie. about of all the animals in the sea, which is the boss? And we concluded that, well, we didn't conclude anything. We came up with yeah. some different opinions. Yeah. Now, what would you say about in the air? What animal is the boss? Well, the bald eagle, probably. The bald eagle. I mean, you wouldn't just say the Cooper's hawk is a little bit more deft and deadly? Well, no, I think it's the, uh, it's the wild turkey. The wild turkey, they're, they're not in the air. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk in turkey language. <laughs> or Pig Latin. Pig Latin. I don't know how to speak Pig Latin. Pig Latin is oak. Like, let's say you say hello. You'd say alohe. That's Hawaiian. No, no, it's Pig Latin. That's Hawaiian. Well, alohe. Or aloha. Airway uye owing <laughs> Okay. We'll have some fun with that on another okay. day. Okay. Um, I'm going to have a chat now with... Uh, Dimethyl tryptamine Dimitri Zaitsev, the analyst, the, the analyst bear from Russia. 
Follow us Versa. on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Make sure you never miss a show by subscribing to our YouTube channel and clicking on the little notifications bell. If you're interested in getting monthly actionable investment ideas in the cannabis space to your inbox, subscribe to the newsletter at MidasLetter.com. Analyst Dimitri Zaitsev joins me now. Dimitri, welcome back. Happy to be here, James, as always. Dimitri, what is going on in your cannabis portfolio these days? Yeah, so I think last time we chatted two or three weeks ago, we were discussing how the U.S. MSOs are the place to be. Mm -hmm. And just shortly after that, we had the Careleaf news. So with them selling CBD products in uh, CVS. Um, and that sent you know, the, the U.S. space higher. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, very notable that the Canadian names, even though we've had such market strength, with the U.S. markets, they've they've been really lackluster. We right. had a, a can't trust miss their earnings, and there was quite a bloodbath from that. Um, so a lots lots happened last two weeks. Mm -hmm. So which. Uh, were you able to expose yourself to the upside in Cureleaf? Yeah, so I, I actually, my core portfolio in terms of US MSOs are Ianthus, GTI, and uh, Cureleaf. Those are sort of my core positions. I have some acreage and some other, you know, other MSOs, but those three are sort of my core for now. Uh -huh. um, and so, yeah, I was able to, I was, I, you always wish you had more, of right. course. I wish I had more Cureleaf, but um, yeah, I was able to trade it. It was great. Um, one trade um, that didn't work out so well was uh, after the CanTrust earnings, for example, I tried to buy the dip there. So it dropped 10%. I said, hey, this looks really good. You know, I, I looked through the you know, transcripts and all that. It seemed pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Osito is very you know, conservative. He just sort of walked everyone through pretty reasonable assumptions, I thought. And uh, I thought 10%, oh, that's, that, that seems pretty good. That'll probably bounce back. Dip and flip, right? Right. As we like to say. <laughs> um, and I got in and it's, you know, within, I, I set very stringent rules for how I trade. Mm -hmm. So as soon as um, it didn't move anywhere for half an hour and you know there was no bounce, you know I got stopped out. I had a stop loss, you know around roughly 15, 20 cents or so hmm. uh, below where I bought it and I got stopped out. And for the next three days it got hammered because there's a lot of retail and everyone was piling into it uh, from what I could see and they just got burnt and so n no one wanted to buy it. But it just goes to show you know proper tr risk management, trade management is important. Right. Hmm. Okay, so what about uh, um, what about now? Like, what? So, what? Are you, where are you at now? I mean, I'm looking at this market, yeah. and it's looking kind of uh, it's kind of you know wandering and not really showing yeah. any real direction or uh, conviction. I guess I would say. So, you know, I'm not a day trader. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'm I'm really not a trader so much as I am an, just an investor, yeah. for the most part. Um, so, but as a as a trader, what are you what are you doing? Yeah, so I'm not a day trader either myself. Um, the way I see it is, it's like we, the valuations are pretty rich mm -hmm. right now. Um, the way I think about it is, look, Canopy's twenty billion dollars, right? If they double, they'd have to you know have significant revenues to back that up. And I could find companies across the market, not even in cannabis, that I can probably, you know, think will double or triple in the next couple of years. So why am I looking over there? If you look at just the MSOs, right, um, the market's way larger that they're addressing, and their market caps are significantly smaller uh, than a lot of these Canadian names. So what I think is happening um, is there's the summer doldrums. You know, everyone's sort of. Uh, Pavlovian conditioning hmm. that, oh, it's summer, um, people got burnt the last two summers. There's probably a little bit of fade there. Not a lot of catalysts on the horizon. Hmm. So what are we waiting for exactly? We had the, the rollout, which was kind of lackluster in Ontario. Uh, some of the names we mentioned on this show, like Meta, right, National Access Cannabis, has, has been doing well since we've spoken about it. Oh, okay. As an example. Um, but yeah, there's really no catalyst. I guess we'll have some edible uh, regulations coming out in the next couple of months um, more firmly mm. coming out um, yeah what do you think is going to happen with the edibles I mean by way of preamble I was at the, yeah. the the highest volume dispensary in San Diego was called urban leaf they did 43 million dollars top line and I said so what's the breakdown in terms of product segments and he said well 50 percent is uh, is premium dried flour 30 mm -hmm. percent are extracts for vaping right and or 
uh, dabbing, so like the waxes, the yep. shatters, the butters, etc., as well as the vape cartridges. And he said that only 15% uh, was uh, was edibles and beverages. Yeah, and what percentage of that is beverages? Like from all the data that I've seen, beverages yeah. are a very small part of uh, how cannabis is consumed in the U.S., where they have a very free market, it's vertically integrated. Like you can have your own brands, you can have, um, unlike in Canada where we don't have any branding, we don't have any edibles right now. Hmm. Um, so look, I'm, I'm just taking a step back and I'm saying, I wrote those HMMJ calls, if you recall. Um, those decayed a lot just because the general market has been, cannabis market has been sort of rolling over. Mm -hmm. Look, the S&P 500 has just been extremely strong and the fact that these uh, Canadian names haven't followed is, is concerning because as soon as um, you have you know, the China deal not work out or some kind of catalyst in the market that sends it lower, you're going to see these cannabis names lose a lot of air. Um, there's other things like, you know, Tilray as an example, that's just bleeding. Right, right. Um, because why? There's no catalyst. There's nothing to. Well, let's talk about Tilray for a second sure. because this is. Uh, I'm I'm surprised at the extent of the of the bloodletting in Tilray, uh, even though I was equally surprised by the valuation it achieved. Though I understood yeah. at the time, I thought, well, that valuation is based on the fact that nobody can sell any stock, and it's all wealthy insiders who mm -hmm. are able to sell the stock, but they're not going to because they don't need to. So, Well, they have been, right? The CEO has been selling a little bit. They've gone some options that they've sort of exercised and sold. Um, well, that's just it. So they've, right. they have either advertently or inadvertently caused the problem they're now facing because they've started to disclose sales, which gives everybody out there, mm -hmm. I mean, it gives the shorts uh, a telegraph saying, okay, there's now some stock you can borrow, mm -hmm. there's more stock in the system to borrow, so the cost of borrowing is going to be cheaper. And it also tells the investor crowd, who are the longer term holders, that management maybe isn't as committed to the long term as they originally Telegraph. So mm -hmm. those are the messages they're sending either inadvertently or overtly. I'm not sure. One could argue that they, uh, they might feel that they've gotten overvalued and that doesn't serve uh, a capital structure in the long term any more than does it being undervalued. So we'll yeah. see. I think you know, them selling just a couple of percent is not really a big deal. If you're a successful CEO and you have all this stock, you're going to want to get some liquidity. I totally understand mm. that. You know, live life, taxes, other issues like that. Um, with Tilray and just cannabis stocks in general, I think a lot of retail investors have recency bias. So they look back and they say, wow, this stock was $300. It could be $300 again. Recency uh, bias. I like that. Yeah, That's recency. That's a new term for me. So you look back, you look back at how this, and I mean, technicals and all that is based on that in, in uh -huh. a sense, right? Because people say, oh, look, before when it went to this price, it bounced back. So this is a good place for me to buy. Hmm. So people look, look at it. When it, our, our, yeah, it IPO'd on the NASDAQ, it was at $24, $25, something like that. And it was, I did like a rough valuation on it and it was still really overvalued at that price. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they do have that J, those JVs and deals that they've had. They've raised you know half a billion dollars on those convertible notes. I'm surprised anyone bought those. Yes. Um, good for the Tilray, like they yeah. killed it. Um, but other than that, like, you know, why should I buy it? Right. What's the point? The financial results have not yet been any reason to I'd say in any cannabis value. company right now, the, the financial results are really unimpressive. Right. I think, you know, the U.S. companies are richly valued, but I think, you know, there's, there's room for them to actually grow. There's a ramp. Right. But um, if you do the math, just assume 10 to 15 times EV EBITDA, uh, which is like a longer term multiple for a lot of these, you know, beverage, tobacco, whatever companies, and you assume, you know, 20 to 40 percent EBITDA margins, you can sort of back out what kind of revenue numbers are needed to justify just these valuations. Right, just today's valuations, and where is that revenue going to come from? It's not really going to come from the U.S. for these Canadian names because they're, you know, they're losing first mover advantage in terms of CBD there, mm. right? Like, look, Kira Lee's already there, Charlotte's Webs are already there. Um, international markets, there's really nothing happening, and you have a bunch of local players like, you know, Chiron, Pharmaciello, Avicana. You know, they're all they're all in the South America. They're trying to lock that down. In Europe, there's a lot of regional players trying to lock down licenses, and the market's very immature there, right? Mm -hmm. Germany just got their tenders, and I think it was it was a couple thousand kilos a year or something that they're allowed to grow. And so while that is a real market and it's fertile, it, it might take a lot longer than some investors will have patience to wait for. Sure. Okay, so over the long term, which segment would you say has the best 
uh, sort of compressed value in it, like relative mm. to like, so there's recreational, yeah. there's what I'm going to call wellness, bioceuticals, and then there's also the, the biopharma level of medical, EU, GMP, extracted, concentrated right. cannabinoids with very pure formulations. And then there's some other ones, but I'm, I don't really consider yeah. them as significant relative to those three potential massive sectors. Yeah, so I think uh, I like to call them, I guess, pockets of value. So um, starting from just the grow, I think some of the maybe Latin American or uh, producers that have really cheap cost per gram, that's sort of a pocket of value because they can sort of uh, differentiate themselves there. Mm -hmm. um, I think indoor grow, so extremely high quality indoor grow, um, that will always have a market for it because there's people that want the flower and they want high quality. So that's another pocket where you can have good margins. I think um, the actual dispensary level, so having a brick and mortar location. So I'm more so, I mean, the problem is a lot of these LPs don't have brick and mortar locations. They, you know, it's fire and flower, national acts, et cetera, uh, that have these brick and mortar locations. But I think those guys can extract value. Right, especially if the regulatory crackdown on the black market actually happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's another pocket of value. Um, on the US side, definitely when you have limited licenses, barriers to entry, right? Um, the dispensaries are definitely pockets of value. Um, the medical, so if you have DINs and all those other things, actual formulations that are, um, you know, dosed properly and, and they're accepted by the medical community, that can have really large margins. And I think brands as well. I think real brands, which we don't have in Canada, except the black market, right? We really, <laughs> really have only the only brands there. Um, but in the US, I think brands are, are going to be able to uh, extract the margin because um, you know, if you know Cure Leaf or you know Charlotte's Web and you know, you know their product, you're going to buy it over some generic thing that, you know, some other generic thing. Because, you know, this is an important thing. It's going into your body, right? You want to sure. know uh, that you trust the provider of that. You bet. All right, we're going to leave it there for now, Dimitri. Thanks very much for your contribution. As per usual, very in-depth. I wish we had more time, but we simply don't today. We'll have you back soon. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, James. Here's some financials that we can expect in the next few weeks. Green Thumb Industries are releasing their fourth quarter and full year 2018 financial results on April 9th after market close with a conference call at 5 p.m. with investors. Afria are releasing their Q3 financials on April 15th with a conference call at 9 o'clock a.m. Delta 9 are releasing their Q4 financials on April 23rd. And Terrasend are releasing their Q4 financials on April 30th. Dimitri's a young man, but he is uh, pretty, pretty wise. I, I enjoy talking to him because he's got great... Uh, Seems to have a lot of uh, discipline. You know the difference which is between, really weird for a youngster. The difference between knowledge and wisdom. Yeah. Knowledge is knowing that. I said I knew. <laughs> so moving right on. No, I'm kidding. I look, you tell me what's okay. So knowledge is knowing that fruit. Let me say it again. <laughs> knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing that you don't put a tomato in a fruit salad. <coughs> Really? Think about that. That's pretty cool. I'm going to tell you what, okay. I'll tell you what about wisdom. Okay. Tell uh, me about wisdom. A guy named Amos Hostetter, who yeah. is one of the most legendary commodities traders on earth. Yeah. His entire philosophy, he died in an untimely car know, crash know, in 1977. I know, I know, I know. And the firm that he worked for, actually it was the uh, uh, commodities corporation that he worked for, commissioned a a work to gather up his wisdom because he was the mentor of a group of great traders and this book was called uh, Amos Hostetter a successful speculators approach to commodities trading yes and uh, a guy named Ed Molesky sent me this and made me promise to read it so I have been reading it and it's uh, it's interesting and timely but I look at these three fundamental rules that he's boiled down his trading philosophy to and I listen to guys like Dimitri Zaitsev and it's like the uh, you know the the thinking is uh, is aligned across decades, without any contact and yep. uh, you know I don't know where he went to school but try to acquire number one try to acquire every bit of fundamental information available read extensively 
Number two, simultaneously post daily charts on commodities and develop a feel for trends. And just to put it into perspective of this conversation, ladies and gentlemen, yes. cannabis is a commodity. And so without these, that fundamental understanding, your success in the, in the cannabis industry will be limited. Cannabis is a commodity. Uh, so number three of his rules is follow the fundamentals in your trading, but only if and as long as the charts do not cast a negative vote. This little triptych of phrases for me has now breached the gap between technical analysis and fundamental analysis. I get it now. Oh, I see. So I've been a fundamental say, guy. Say thanks, Ed. Well, I'm saying say thanks th to Amos. No, no, Ed. Because No, no, it wasn't you. It was yeah, this guy, Ed yeah, Molesky, yeah. who gave it to me. I come back in another life, life yeah. form. Okay, good for you. Okay, uh, you know what? Speaking of guys with uh, extreme Amos discipline. Is it Amos or Amos? Amos. I think it's Amos. I'm changing it. He's dead. How are you going to know? It's Amos. He just told me. Amos from on high. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of guys with the breadth okay. of uh, knowledge and wisdom and good disciplinary skills set in the trading realm and the technical analysis realm, uh, we're joined now by Dan Charting, blah, charting Man Dan McDermott. from thechartguys.com. Dan, how are you today? Wonderful, James, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm great, it's good to see you. You as well. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's, today let's talk a bit about some of the tradable patterns that technical analysis yields to people like you who have developed expertise in what is, can only be described as uh, acute pattern recognition. So uh, tell me about some of, the, uh, some of the patterns you're seeing today in some of the stocks, and, uh, and rather than just dive in straight technically what's happening, tell us what it is about the pattern generally that you like. Absolutely. So a consistent pattern that we see in the market is after periods of large volatility, the market will generally give us tightening ranges as it's a bit of price discovery. So if we see a 10% you know, move, we usually get tighter and tighter and tighter. And we look for these tightening patterns because when they break, they get a spike in volatility again. So it's almost like going from a period of volatile action to calming down, reaching an equilibrium of a really tight range. And then we get a volume and volatility spike. And that's a trading opportunity that we jump on. So while we don't know which direction those patterns are going to break. We look for the signals, and we'll talk a little bit with some examples here in just a moment of how we establish trade game plans based off of support and resistance levels and how to act on those. Okay, um, how, do you, how do you allocate uh, odds or risk in terms of, so when you see a tightening pattern, do you say, do you, do you try to establish uh, a scenario in your head where you say, okay, there's a 70% chance that this is going in the direction I think it's going to with a 30% chance that I'm completely wrong, in which case I, I, I hedge my bets with stop losses. Is that kind of part of your process at all? Yep, absolutely. So just want to differentiate risk to reward would be a little bit different than the odds of a break, and I'll distinguish between the two. The odds of a break, we're going to be looking at individual little pieces of the puzzle, whether that's volume or indicators like RSI or information like what, what the preceding trend was doing, and even fundamentally, you know, how the sector is reacting. Maybe we had some bullish rea reaction and earnings from someone else in the sector or something along those lines. These are all little pieces of the puzzle that 
have little sh slight shifts in the percentage odds of which direction we're going to break or how confident we are in the pattern. And I'm certainly more confident in some patterns than in others. Now, risk to reward is when we're looking at what is our risk before we get stopped out of the trade and what is the potential for upside that we could see in if we get the follow through. So I have an example where we'll look at risk to reward for a specific trade here in just a second, but they're a little bit different in terms of one is based off of support and resistance levels and the other is based off of pretty much a library of historical information in my brain. So if I've looked at 50,000 charts in my life, I've seen these patterns play out many, many times. And if you have a good memory, you start to develop you know, what is most likely to happen in different scenarios because you've seen it before. Hmm. Yes, you know, that's interesting. Uh, I had a good memory when I was, uh, till I was about 42, and then it, it really started to go south. And it's not because I, you know, I actually drink, drink incrementally le less than I ever have. I certainly don't really care to smoke too much cannabis anymore. Uh, so it's like, I guess it's just one of those age things, but I've noticed that my ability to retain pattern recognition signals has diminished with age. Um, so have, you've got 50,000 uh, patterns or charts that you've seen in your head. That's great, Dan, but I, I'd be <laughs> lucky if I can remember five at this point. So you're saying that in a decade, I'm gonna be out of a career. Well, I just think that you're going to have to rely more on your uh, your charm and good looks more so than your memory. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Dan, let's uh, let's talk a bit about that. Um, why don't we go to the charts now and you tell me exactly what you're talking about? So as always, we want to know what the broader market is doing first things first, and we can see that aver over the last seven days, we have seen a higher low on the S&P 500 every single day. So that's obviously a very strong trend. We are at the 2019 highs, and we zoom out to the weekly time frame and look at the bounce that has taken place. And again, it's pretty flabbergasting at this point, but we're looking at all-time highs, and we are less than 2% away from those all-time highs. So we know that any price action that has happened in the Canadian or U.S. marijuana space in the last three plus months since the lows of December has been the ideal environment for bulls to trade in. Last time we were at all-time highs, the Canadian MJ sector was running crazy going blue sky breakout. So we have to just preface everything knowing that this is the ideal environment for bulls. It will not always be the case that this is, you know, this strong of a bull market, but for now, that's where we stand. So going back to what we were talking about just a bit ago in terms of risk to reward and basing entries off of support levels and tightening ranges. So a very common tightening range is the equilibrium pattern, which is marked by higher lows and lower highs in a tightening range. And like I said, it, it comes after periods of high volatility. So CVSI here is CV Sciences. It's a CVD play in the U.S., and they just made a monster bull move where the size of this move in just a week and a half was almost a 50% move. So big time move. And then we start to consolidate in a tightening range. We have the high of the move and the low of initial consolidation. That is now our range. We bounce and we anticipate a lower high is going to form because tightening ranges are most likely. Now, those little details that I talked about in terms of what could change the percentage chance of what's most likely to happen, if on this bounce, if we were seeing increasing solid bull volume in line with the bull volume on the original move up, we could definitely see continuation. But because the bull volume is unimpressive and because we already know that the most likely scenario is a lower high, we look for that to happen. So then as we pulled back, we head back to our key support level down at 550. That's the low of the pullback. So yesterday, the low of the day hit 553, and I made an entry into CVSI, as did some other members, based off of this support level. We know that we are fairly likely to hold that 550 support, and when we were down testing that level, the RSI on the hourly time frame was oversold. So that tells me that in oversold conditions, we're more likely to hold a support level. So I made an initial entry in the low 560s, a little bit more patient traders would have made an entry in the 550s. But let's just say for uh, for example case here that we have an entry at 560 and your stop loss below 550. You're risking about 11, 12 cents if you were to get stopped out. And if we were wrong, that the bounce is not going to take place. And this is not a tightening pattern. So we'll say a 12 cent risk. So what is the reward for the trade? Well, we're going to anticipate that if this support holds, the bulls are going to bounce and form another lower high compared to 621. 
In the end, we did get a tiny bit of follow through this morning, not significant. So a pretty unimpressive follow through move after the strong close yesterday. But even with that being the case, the entry from 560 would have resulted in 30 cents of possible upside. So my risk is 12 cents and my reward is 30 cents. So that's about a, a two and a half to one reward to risk ratio, which I always want to have as a, as a guideline, a rule of thumb, two to one risk to reward. Because if I'm risking 12 cents and I'm only looking to make 12 cents, that's not really the ideal kind of trade we want to be in. We want to be able to see moves that have reward bigger than what the potential loss is. So another example, of tightening ranges. Here's Cron on the hourly time frame. And it's just been tightening the last few days. And we're actually right at support right now, where we have our low of the pullback, high of the bounce, higher low, lower high. And if we turn off extended hours, that just makes it a little bit cleaner, where it's just a tightening range. We formed another higher low at 1816. We have a lower high at 1853. So we can see three days in a row of lower highs, but we also have the higher lows forming. And we did just break. 1816 support, but only by a penny. So we, whenever we're entering a trade, we want to ensure that our stop losses allow for enough space for a couple cents of wiggle room at least. Because right now, if you're making a trade based off of the 1816 support, we're seeing a tiny bounce at this point. If we're going to stay in this equilibrium pattern, the bulls have to see a bounce back up to the 1830s. And then we would look for a break on Monday because we get to a point where we get so tight that we can't possibly stay in the tightening pattern any longer. And right now, if we do close today or see some bounce follow through into the 1830s, we will stay in this pattern into Monday. So it's making an entry, perhaps based on support, or if things get really tight, I personally just wait for the break because the break usually sees a volume spike associated with it and then direction and momentum. So I want to be profitable in a trade as soon as I enter. So if I wait for these resistance levels to break on increasing bull volume, that's going to ensure that I am likely going to see a profitable trade and follow through as soon as I enter. So now we're going to look at TLRY, which is in all out dump mode. And we got plenty of red flags that we were going to be entering an area with a lack of support after the exponential run up from when we started trading, we're now falling back into that zone and we did not establish many support levels on the way up. I'm looking at 55.55 and then down to 49.50 and you can see there's all these gaps mixed in here and just an area where there's a lack of support, we can see RSI levels get overextended. So I love oversold bounces. It's one of my edges. I've had years of practice and I can see from my statistics that I have I perform well in oversold bounces. I certainly do not suggest that newer traders try and play oversold bounces without a lot of experience because it's a great way to be playing counter trend and to be stuck in positions without having any idea on when to exit. And then that's when things can get ugly. So for me, I'm going to be looking to begin scaling into TLRY potentially starting next week because the daily RSI is down in the low 20s. The four hour RSI is down in the low 20s. The hourly RSI down in the low 20s. And when we get a scenario with all these longer term timeframes lining up oversold, we generally get a solid bounce. So whenever we do find a bottom, we're going to expect a 10% bounce off those lows just as a conservative rough number, but there's no sign that the bottom has been set yet. So personally, I scale into these trades and let's say I make an entry on $59 support breaking. That's one of three entries. I'll then reserve a second entry for 57 and then a third entry for 55. And if we were to drop down towards 55 in the next two trading days, RSI levels would be at all time lows. And we would just be getting ready for that short covering and bulls getting in for that quick oversold bounce. So again, certainly higher risk in terms of not being an easy trade, playing counter the trend, but it is something that I'm watching into next week, TLRY, and we'll see if this bounce ends up playing out. So those are some examples of using support and resistance to establish some trade game plans to limit your risk and hopefully maximize reward in these trades. Thanks for having me on, James. I'll see you next time. All right, Dan, that was great. Thanks very much for joining us. As per usual, your contribution is much appreciated. We'll see you soon. If you like the show, you'll love our website. Visit us at www.midasletter.com for interviews with key CEOs, cannabis news, and to subscribe to our newsletter. Even 10 seconds. 10 seconds! Ah! We're back, everybody, and uh, Charting Man Dan, a little choppy there, but... Uh, you, you know what? Charting Man Dan knows a hell of a lot about technical analysis because it, it seems to me he's got lots of practical experience yeah i think you know viewers should heed his wisdom i like how articulate he is without you know, losing you so it's like very uh losing you
losing you isn't the right thing to do. I don't know. Don't get me started. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Amazing. Charting Man Den. You know, uh, we just saw Chiron print 336. That's, no, uh, no. I, I stand corrected. You stand corrected. 363. 363. And yesterday you could have bought it 320. There's, 323. There's, there's 10%. 10%. Bang. Bang. Bang, bang. Bang, bang, bang. Throw in a million, take out a million. T one. Well, was it that liquid? No, not that liquid. Not that liquid. So what no, was the volume in there? Let's say you threw in uh, 30 grand. You could have taken out 33 grand. If you knew when to sell it. Well, you sell it now. But, but see, here's the problem I have. How do you sell it when it's going up? And then you but go you to the bathroom care. and you, you come don't back. You don't care. You you want to take your money out. You you see, want that's to make why money. I'm not a trader. That's right. Because you 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 fall in love with. Oh, what if I can make more? Mm, not true. I just you, forget about it, and I've got. Well, other do you things. think you need to get out of the top? No, I don't leave care. Leave in leave something for somebody else. I don't care. I need money when I need money. When I don't need money, I don't sell anything. Okay, that's it. I'm not. A, I'm not a manager. I'm not a money guy. I'm not about the money. No, I'm about not. the funny, honey. <laughs> no money though. If there's no money. There's no honey, and there's no funny. Yeah. No. I see. I got people have to basically beat me over the head, say buy this and hold it till you die, which I do. Uh, what die? Yeah. Well, here we are. It's fi it's uh, Friday afternoon already. Another Friday. Yeah. Friday after another. Time time doesn't stop, does it? Time. The arrow of time moves in one direction, and it never stops. Yeah. Nor does it slow. Time flies like an arrow. Fruit flies like a banana. I think fruit flies prefer peaches. Uh, they like bananas too. Fruit flies, I like that. Uh, <laughs> stuck. Have you ever seen me stuck for something to say? Jesus, Donald. Donald. The implications there. Do Donald. Boy, oh boy. But you know what? Just because we are on a roll and, uh, yeah, let's, uh, you know who stopped by today? And I just wanted to point out that Alan Brockstein will be presenting at the uh, Benzinga conference here in Toronto on April 16th and 17th at the Royal York what Hotel. What kind of conference? Benzinga. Who's Benzinga? Benzinga is this media outfit out of the States. That is that his last name, Zinga? No, that's not, Al Brockstein is not Benzinga, but Alan no, no, is no, the but, keynote speaker and the MC of the event. But is, the, is, there, is that a person, Benzinga? No. Not that I know of. Okay. There probably is a Benzinga, but I don't think he's an owner of Benzinga. Well, he should be. I think he should invest in Bazooka. Ba Bazooka. I so, think they're all from Armenia or something. <laughs> no, Armenian names and then I A N. Or K A. No, not no. Here's here's Alan Brockstein. He's definitely if you're enjoying not enjoying the show. Subscribe to Midas Letter on YouTube so you stay up to date on everything investment. Welcome back. Alan Brockstein's with me now. He is the Chartered Financial Analyst at Invest420. Alan, how are you today? I'm doing great. Nice slow Friday, James. Yeah, it, it is really slow out there in the marketplace. What's, uh, what's, uh, what's, your, what's your take on the, on the action today in the cannabis space? I'm not seeing a lot of action today, really. I'm seeing a, a lack of uh, reaction to what I thought was some interesting news out of uh, Germany. Uh, you know, it's, it's a small amount of cannabis uh, on the surface for sure, but uh, kudos to uh, American, Aurora, and Afria for winning those uh, initial lots. Right. So uh, give, us, uh, give us an update. What, is, what happened in, uh, in Germany? Well, so Germany's been delayed and delayed and delayed, and they, they finally announced their initial tenders. Uh, like I said, it's, it's not a lot of cannabis. But it's a first step, and uh, you know I think it puts those three comp companies in maybe front runner position over time. Uh, so we'll see how it plays out. But definitely, uh, at a very minimum, a validation of, of those three companies. There were apparently 77 bidders. Right. Huh. Well, I guess uh, it is a step in the right direction. Are you surprised by how, lo how long this legislation has been delayed in Germany? Oh, I'm kind of used. I don't know German uh, politics that well, James, but I'm pretty used to uh, government delays. So no, the answer is no without knowing a lot. Right. Um, okay. So 
do you think that this is, uh, you know, is this going to catalyze uh, more momentum in the European Union generally, or do you think this is going to just result in a, okay, Germany's doing it, let's wait and see how their experience goes before we move forward? No, I think Germany really sets the stage. It's not the only way for companies to get into the EU. Uh, you know, Tilray and a few others are in Portugal. Uh, you know, Malta is an up and coming uh, way to get into uh, in, into the EU. But, uh, you know, clearly Germany is going to have production on the ground. And this is a first step for that. And Germany's the largest country. And uh, I think it's going to be pretty exciting. There's some other countries too, like Denmark, that are already on board. but. Uh, make no mistake, I mean, the, the European market is huge compared to Canada, let's say. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah. there's 502 million residents of uh, the e European Union. So when people yeah. say to me, which is a common refrain, then they say, yes, and we're in California, which is the largest market in the world. I like to say, well, except for the one that's actually 10 times bigger than California called Europe. <laughs> right. Well, it depends on how you define it, but that's true. Sure. But, you know, they're describing a market. You can go regional, you can go national, you can go international. Exactly. You sure. can go continental. Yeah. Arguably, <laughs> arguably, that would make uh, North America, I think, the most populous continent in terms of, oh no, it would be Asia, but Asia's not really making any moves towards cannabis, even though I read a story in The Economist yesterday, which to my surprise uh, informed me that China is in fact the world's largest grower of legal hemp. Yeah, I know. That, that's uh, pretty well known, actually, but people don't like to talk about it. Uh, there's fears about the... Uh, quality there, I don't know. But uh, you know, the big story this week, James, was uh, clearly uh, more M&A in the United States. It was just a few weeks ago that uh, Harvest catalyzed its stock with that out of the blue acquisition of Verano Holdings. This week, uh, Cresco, which had already filled a void in its portfolio by buying a private company in Florida, filled an even larger void, one that remains for other uh, MSOs, and that's in California. And, uh, I'm sure your listeners know they, they're buying Origin House, which has been one of my favorite stocks for a long time, so I was glad to see that. Yeah, we had yeah. Uh, we had actually Mark Lustig graced us with his presence the day of, so that was uh, that was a revelation. And actually, I I've been spending the last couple of days with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Nalink Ja, and he is the CEO of Green Relief, which is at this point is a private Canadian LP. Uh, they're somewhat noteworthy for the fact that they grow their cannabis uh, via aquaponic means, meaning with, uh -huh. in the presence of fish who provide the fertilizer, right. and. Yeah. And uh, it's an interesting story because Dr. Ja is uh, is a uh, neurosurgeon and a uh, and a behavioral economist, and he actually sits on a board that uh, uh, advises um, you know advises globally. He's one of the worldwide experts in uh, traumatic brain concussions. And so we've been having a long conversation about the future of, uh, of and the promise of cannabis for that, the widening sort of uh, bio, biological biotech uh, applications. Um, but so, yeah, so very interesting there. Um, so do you think that the, uh, you know the deal with Cresco, and oh, my point there was that uh, Mark uh, Mark um, Lustig, the CEO of Origin House, had invested in not in Green Relief, but in one of the subsidiaries. So we'll be bringing more ah. coverage of that, and I'll I'll try to get some time with you. You're coming up to Toronto for the uh, Benzinga conference, where I think you're keynoting, aren't you? Yeah, I'll be there, and I'll be there for 420. Yeah, right. Of course. Uh, great. Well, I'll look forward to seeing you then. Um, now, tell me. Uh, so, this deal with with uh, Cresco and Origin House that was the largest public company transaction in uh, in history in the United States, wasn't it? Uh, well, no, but for the cannabis space, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, that's right. That's what I meant. Sorry, you got me there. <laughs> uh, okay. So now, do you think that that makes Cresco more attractive as a uh, as a as a buy for in longer term investors at this point? 
I, you know, it's hard for me to say. These, these MSOs are really tough. It's, uh, you know, uh, I don't think investors really know them very well. We haven't seen a lot of operating history because most of them just came public. Origin House was obviously a little bit earlier, so people know that story fairly well. I think, uh, you know, anybody that was looking for flaws in Cresco would have probably, you know, said they don't have Florida and they don't have California. And so now they check those boxes. Uh, I mean, I, I thought before that Cresco was certainly a top contender, and uh, I think this probably validates that even further. Uh, I, I would just caution, one of the things I've been telling my subscribers at 420 Investor is to just be a little bit careful in the MSO space and uh, be cognizant that a lot of these stocks have very thin floats. And so the momentum traders can get hold of, and I'm not trying to pick on Cresco necessarily, performed very well after the acquisition. Harvest did very well after their acquisition, and now they announced the financing. So just be cognizant of uh, tight floats and the need to raise capital over time in general. And uh, so the bottom line is you don't need to chase these stories, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you think that the valuation that Origin got? Do you? How would you categorize that? Fair, high, low? I was a little disappointed. It was in uh, my longer-term focus model portfolios. I had uh, as a CFA, you're not allowed to use the word promise, so I never would have used that word. But I, I basically had told my subscribers to expect a new all-time high, which was achieved just before the deal. Uh, but I was really looking for it to get to a billion U.S. Uh, on its own. So I think, uh, you know, Origin House definitely had its pick of the, the litter and uh, went with Cresco. I, I, I have a feeling Mark's a very smart guy. Uh, he's been in the space working very hard for a while. And uh, while I was disappointed and I told him with the actual price that he got in terms of 0.8428 shares of Cresco, uh, if you look at the relationship between those stocks, you know, that was, that was pretty close to the low. That's still pretty close to the low. Uh, with that said, I think it says a lot about what Mark Lustig and his uh, team and, and the board of directors must think about Cresco as, as a partner for the long term. I think uh, having watched Mark for uh, several years now, I, I don't think he was ever uh, in this for a short term. So I, I would uh, say that the disappointing price in the short term, uh, I bet you Mark would say it would be addressed in the long term. Right, right. That's uh, that's a common refrain we've heard. Uh, you know, Hexo taking out a new strike with no premium. Ah, that's yeah, the argument. But I got to yeah. think that for the uh, for the for the newer investor, it's a, just a tremendous disappointment. Yeah. Well, and I had a position in a, in a, I have a model portfolio that's just focused on LPs, and you know, I saw that, and I've been really warming up to Hexo. I mean, people that follow me know. Uh, uh, it just hasn't been one of my favorite stories, but I, I really like that deal. Uh, one of the weaknesses in Hexo, and there's a lot of strengths, but one of the weaknesses, in my opinion, has been reliance on a single facility uh, as well as on a single buyer, Quebec. And uh, the Hexo deal, and I, I was, sorry, New Strike deal. I was never a huge fan of New Strike, but it, the stock was very cheap. They're one of the higher revenue generators, and they have a nice runway. That was a nice deal, and uh, I think anybody following the space should think more highly of Pexo now. They got a great deal, and it was a good strategic fit. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's put on our speculation hats now. Uh, who do you think is ripe for uh, either being taken over or being a consolidator? Uh, on the takeover side, you know, I, I've, I've said for a while, I, ca I came out with a while, uh, a while ago, I came out with a list, and uh, three of the names on the list were Emblem, CanTrust, and Organogram. Well, Emblem was acquired. Uh, I think there might have been a fourth one on there as well. It might have been Hexo, believe it or not. But uh, at this point in time, I, I think both Organogram and and CanTrust certainly have a viable path forward without being acquired, but uh, I would put them at the top of the list. They're both leading companies that have proven themselves in many ways, uh, CanTrust's recent stumble notwithstanding. And uh, the valuations for anybody looking, if any sort of strategic player looking to get into the market, you know, obviously Aurora is still out there uh, until Ray is very large players that don't yet have those strategic 
uh, relationships like uh, Kronos and Constellation. But I, I would think a very large strategic buyer, which could come out of the pharm pharmaceutical industry, uh, you know, might want a lower price tag. Uh, so those two have a, a much lower price tag than their larger peers. Uh, and you know, they're trading cheaper by any number of metrics. Right. Um, do you think that Aurora's uh, share structure is a uh, impediment to their acquisition if a dan with a major globalized dance partner, partner, assuming that that's what they're after? I suspect uh, just because I have you know a lot of conversations with uh, various elements of management at Aurora on a regular basis, they really give me the impression that they're not. They're not out there looking for that big dance partner per se. They rather like to think that they can go out and attract a, w a wide range of dance partners across a bunch of different sectors. And so they're not in a hurry. Uh, certainly they've demonstrated the ability to access capital on increasingly reasonable terms. That last debt deal was, uh, was, was not onerous in terms of dilution, unless of course they're unable to make that big payment in uh, five years. But, uh, you know, the whole market could be a very different place in five years. I think within five years we might uh, have already gone through the big consolidation where all of the, the era of the, you know, the startup that goes from a hundred million to a billion in, in six short weeks. I think that might be in the rear view mirror sooner rather than later. And so companies like Aurora have a better chance. Do you, do, would you say that that's in line with where, what you think or do you think uh, that we're still likely to see a lot of uh, a lot of uh, high impact speculations come through. So Aurora's not paying me to tell them what to do, but I, I would tell them not to do one of those strategic deals. Uh, I, when I think back to like what the alcohol industry's done since uh, prohibition was ended, and you know why sell out now? Uh, the only problem that companies have, in my opinion, right now is uh, you know access to really large amounts of capital. Can you imagine if, if Aurora wanted to be on the same footing as, uh, as Canopy Growth, where are they gonna get $5 billion? Because everybody's all excited about the, the cash. So there'd be a lot of dilution to raise that kind of money without any near-term payoff. But people don't, uh, that invest in Kronos and Canopy you know, don't seem to be bothered by that they essentially gave up control of the company. So uh, maybe somebody will acquire all of Aurora. I certainly am not planning on that. And uh, I think we've seen other types of deals. Tilray and Hexo have uh, done collaboration deals that didn't involve equity at all, uh, but uh, joint investment, things like that. And uh, I, I would think that the Pelt's uh, advisory would not be to necessarily find a strategic buyer per se. I, th I think that the company line of trying to do lots of deals across multiple industries is, is probably the smart route to go. Right. Well, time will tell. There's. Uh... <laughs> It's a, it, it's a, it might be a little quiet today, but I think in the macro picture, it's a very dynamic market, probably one of the most dynamic uh, markets in the world currently. Um, all right, Alan, well, I really appreciate the conversation as usual. I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. And, uh, yeah, first time thanks. ever. Let's talk about Aurora. Recently, your financials, you've mm -hmm. more or less delivered Here on Here are the headlines moving markets today. Yeah, if you're lucky to buy it uh, three days ago at 37 cents. And I you think it has a lot it. to do with uh, some of these smaller names giving... Really Recreational cannabis is here. It's yeah. quite dry. So I'm going to eliminate the stocky bits. Oh, this, there's one that actually... Works. <laughs> hey everybody, welcome back. Guess what? I was talking to somebody else off camera. Ready for the... That's easy for you to say. <laughs> now you're talking tongues. No, talking in tongues is. <laughs> oh, that's a turkey. No, a turkey's. Go, 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 go. <laughs> Jesus. Thank God it's Friday, eh, Ed? Oh. <laughs> oh. oh. Yeah, oh. I, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, on the wagon now, five days. You know what? I'm going to show you something that you've never seen before. This is uh, Friday, and we were going to test this. Jesus. Oh, 
Anyway, here we are. By, <laughs> I'm here by myself. Let I'm back. Uh -oh. We're back here. And I just wanted to uh, share with everybody. This is what I got. You, what are you doing this weekend? Here's what I'm doing this weekend. Bum, 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 bum. Ew, I am from France, and I am here to fuck you all, eh? Bend over, you motherfuckers. No, that's, uh, look at this butt, eh? So this here, this is what we call homegrown, meaning, oh, that smells so good. It was grown in my buddy's home, and I would tell you who it is, but I don't, not sure that he wants to be named, so I'm not going to do that. But let's just say, uh, let's just say, this is pretty much the nicest bud I've seen dried and delivered in Canadian history. Yeah. Now, now is it does it grow on with this thing around it? No, but this is actually really cool too. Look at the canister he brought brought it to me in. Nice Whoa. canister. Whoa! It's a bedro can canister. These are. These are museum pieces. Bedro can? Where it's Bedro can come from? Anyways, look at that bud, eh? This is what I hope to be growing. And my friend obviously can grow and has grown very well. But we were going to test this today and I wanted to test it today so I could smoke it on the weekend, but we didn't get the testing lab set up. So we're going to test this next week. You're going to test it for its... For we're going to test uh, it for the CBD and THC content. And can you do that? Can I do that? Yeah. I can do anything I want. Well, then do it. Well, I'm going out, but next week. Why not do it? Because we don't have enough time left. How much time we got left? We're at 425. We got five more minutes left. No, we don't. Four minutes. Four minutes left. Then the show's over. So it's got to be next week because it takes like half an hour to did test. You, did you say shove over? Shove over. No, uh, we're going to test it next week because we've got to drag out the testing machine. It takes a little bit. Right. And the test has to be conducted in a very particular fashion in order for it to be accurate. And so... Is it hermet hermetically sealed? No. Does it have to be hermetically sealed? No. No. It's a device that measures the effect of protons on the... Uh, the, the response of, of protons to certain protons. elements. Protons. Protons in the light. Really? Photons, not protons. Photons. Phot yeah. I was Photons. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's a photon device. And it can also, it also doubles as a disintegrator. Really? Yeah. So you point it at it's somebody like a, it's and it's like, like, a, like, like, like a, is this a bit of a... <laughs> it's like a death ray. Yeah. Well, kind of. What, about, like a what about good old Johnny Ray? Johnny Ray? Good old Johnny Ray. Don't know that song. Who did Come that? Come on, Eileen. Come on, Eileen. Yeah. Oh, so I you do know that song. Eileen. So you don't even know what morning. song you do. You say you, you don't know it. You... Everything. Da -da 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 that's no, how I it starts. That song. Good old Johnny Ray. Oh, that's what they're saying there. Good old Johnny Ray. That's it. Look at Flower Corpse up 37 cents today. Uh -huh. Well, what do you think here? What do you think? It looks like. I'm, I'm going to leave. I'm going to want to leave a, a message here, okay? We're going to show the bloopers in a second. But just. Come on, Eileen. Oh, ah. What? Now what? Oh, guess what's happening next week? Flower Corp is going to be here. They just released their financials. Grown Rogue will be here. Yeah, it stocks up 35 cent, 37 cents. They just said it. I know. Next week, I'm going to be in Peru all week. So it's going to be like, Stomp and Tom Connors is going to be here. No, he won't be here. Ed Molesky will be here. I'll though. be here. Ed Molesky will be here. I'll be here. here. Uh, Howard Glassman, Humble Howard from Humble and Fred will be here. The whole week? week. Yes. Are you gone for the whole week? I'm gone for at least one week. At least. At least. Could be longer? Could be longer. Why am I smiling? I don't know. Could be longer. I might... Uh, I've heard I might, that before. I might go from Peru to Rio de Janeiro to shoot some segments in our Rio studio. Because you know Your now... Re the real studio or the Rio studio? Rio. Her name is Rio and she dances on the sand. Duran Duran. Blooper time, everybody. Happy Friday. See y'all later. Hello. What, do you, what, what is that uh, procedure you're doing there? This is called the, uh, I can't remember.
When I eat a normal chocolate bar, not too much happens. No. Nope. When I eat one of these chocolate bars, a lot happens. What do you drive? I drive a car. Oh, it's not a tractor. <laughs> <laughs> but then you change direction. Ed, I'll give you 50 bucks if you can read what that says on the teleprompter. This, you know, eight people in the world have the same wealth as the bottom half of the world's population. I know, isn't it glorious? And, <laughs> no, just kidding. No, no. Ed, did you hear that smoking marijuana can stunt your growth? Now you tell me. Now you tell me. <laughs> you know what's up big today? Planet Hollywood. No, Planet Holly. What, what's the name of that? Guy? Planet 13. What is it? I think we should start every statement with full disclosure. Full disclosure, Ed's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Technically, an extension of your head becomes your hat. Hard hat. Hard head. Hard headed hat. But this is going nowhere. We're going to measure weight, we're going to measure CBD, we're going to measure THC, and then we're going to smoke it. And then we'll be talking like this. Then we'll become one with the cone head. And it will be one. You wouldn't let anybody uh, mess with your dirty shorts? Well, <laughs> do, you know what the opposite of plethora is? Dearth. <laughs> okay. That's my eyeball. How That's about that? That's hilarious. That's fantastic, Ed. Okay, okay, this is an art class. Okay. What's oh. the long word? What's the long form of snick? Snickeroo. <laughs> You know I tape you and we're having private conversations. Well, I'm taping you right now. <laughs> so I'm going to grow them, I'm going to veg them for the Wait, month. What's that noise? That's, uh, that's your foot? That's my foot oh, dancing. Yeah. Sector-wide catalyst? Sector-wide catalyst. <laughs> SWC. You didn't hear sector-wide catalyst sector pills this morning. Any sector-wide catalyst out there today?